It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry LeSeur and Griffin Bancroft. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Val Peterson, Administrator of the Federal Civil Defense. Well, as you know, our concerns about civil defense go in very sharply defined ups and downs, depending, of course, on what the Russians are doing at the moment. Well, at the moment, they seem to be flying doves of peace. So we'd like to ask our guest tonight just how long he thinks we can go on postponing real civil defense. Well, we can't afford to postpone it at all because I, I wouldn't want to be brash enough to try to guess uh, what the Russian intentions are at any given moment. I, I assume that they've made their intentions pretty clear to the people of the United States and of the world uh, in recent years. And, of course, their literature has made their intentions clear ever since uh, 1917. Well, Governor Peterson... We, we postpone at our peril. Well, do you... Yes. I was going to say, do you think space or, or time is on our side? No, I, 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 uh, I certainly couldn't say that it is. I, I have no reason to believe that it is. I hope it is, but I have no reason to believe that it is. Well, Governor Peterson, I wanted to ask, to what extent is... Uh, is civil defense a, a national problem on the national level, or to what extent is it a problem for the states and local communities? Well, our civil defense law in the United States at the present time uh, is written in such a way that civil defense is a cooperative enterprise between the national government, the states, and the localities. And I suppose I am the only individual in the federal government whose troops, so to speak, are uh, under the control directly of the state authorities and the local authorities. And my job, of course, at the, at the federal level is to, is to uh, gather information and to disseminate that information to the people in the states and in the cities. And we have unparalleled sources of information in the scientific uh, agencies that are uh, organized and active in Washington and through the Department of Defense. And we do do a job of disseminating this information to the people in the 48 states that they couldn't do for themselves locally. Also, it is our job to exercise some leadership, and we provide some money for civil defense. Well, the actual control is in the, on the local level. Do you think that's right, or do you think there should be more uh, uh, concentrated federal control? Well, uh, that's a subject that you could debate. I mean, uh, I th either one of us could take either side of it with a certain amount of logic. However, I'm inclined to think and I've thought about this a good many times, and I've operated both at the local level, you see, as the governor of a state. Uh, matter of fact, we drew up the Civil Defense Act in my state that during the time that I was in office, and uh, now I'm operating at the national level. But there's a great deal of sense in having civil defense a local responsibility, because if and when this attack occurs upon the United States, the bombs will fall in the localities, and the job will be so big that no country in the world will ever be able to afford the luxury of a hired civil defense. Okay. Because civil defense mm -hmm. will involve your life and mine and every man, woman, and child. And you couldn't put enough people in uniform. You couldn't pay enough people to do their job. If you want to live, you will have to do something about it. Well, Mr. Peterson, it would seem to me that in a Cold War of unknown duration, that a lot of the long-range planning would have to be done by the government rather than the communities. It would take, for example, the dispersal of industry. How about that? Well, we're, that's right. We are doing long-range planning at the national level, and that is perfectly proper. Now, in the dispersal of industry, the responsibility in that field, it happens in the federal government, rests with Dr. Arthur Fleming, who is at the head of the Office of Defense Mobilization. And the way in which he's going about to get dispersal of defense industries is by offering to them certain tax benefits if they build new defense plants outside of these congested metropolitan areas. And quite a little bit of that's going on at the present time. I'm sorry that I don't have the dollar figure in mind, but more of it than the, you would suspect is going on right now. Mr. Peter, what, uh, what happens to your civil defense organizations when nothing is happening? Do they deteriorate, or are they valuable to the community in any other way? 
Well, actually, the, the only really good thing or bright side of this whole picture is that civil defense is a very sensible, peacetime, everyday type of an organization for a community. Now, one of my jobs at the national level uh, by presidential order is to coordinate uh, all activities of the federal government, all units of the federal government in disaster relief. Now, we're always having in the United States, because we're such a large continental area, uh, in the 48 states and the five territories, we're always having floods, uh, tornadoes, earthquakes, uh, large fires, and uh, in recent weeks, we've had a whole uh, series of hurricanes. And we need a, a civilian machinery to, to meet those community uh, disasters. And we're going to have them forever. And the only good thing about civil defense, or one of the good things about civil defense, is that the techniques and the machinery that we need to meet civilian disasters, peacetime disasters, is exactly, are exactly the, the procedures and the machinery that we need to meet an atomic disaster. Well, then you think, in other words, that even if we don't have a war, that your civil defense effort will be worthwhile? In Absolutely. Way. And uh, as a matter of fact, there is a lot more civil defense in the United States than you and I might think unless we look backwards and saw how far we have come. And I could name for you community after community, from Honolulu to New York, where civil defense, in some of its components, is outstanding and doing a wonderful job. And let me just name two or three of them. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, I found one of the best auxiliary police units in America. It's a civil defense auxiliary police force. Uh, we'll have to have such forces in the event of any kind of a, an atomic or natural disaster. Uh, in the Buffalo, New York, there's a wonderful civilian defense uh, auxiliary police force. In Honolulu, they have one of the best, and in all of Hawaii, they have one of the best medical programs in America. And that's due to the fact that they saw the necessity for one in, in those first few minutes following the bombing, bombing of Pearl Harbor. In Memphis, Tennessee, you find uh, the uh, amateur radio people organized in a very proficient manner. And uh, in other cities in the United States, you will find the fire people well organized in the rescue uh, field. And it takes specific uh, equipment and rescue techniques to save the lives of people when you're pulling them out of debris. You just can't do it with a big, strong uh, back and, uh, and a willing, uh, willing uh, hands at the time of the emergency. Mr. Peterson, you were saying before that uh, you wouldn't care to prophesize on whether time was on our side, but how about the time that we need to uh, erect systems of warning against possible attacks? Isn't that uh, on our side at the moment? Aren't we doing something there? Well, we're doing a good job in the United States, as to the best of my knowledge, uh, in this business of creating a vast detection system that will permit us to know when and if uh, enemy bombers intrude into our uh, area and it would let us know some four to six hours in advance of the arrival of those bombers over our great metropolitan cities. And that time is absolutely vital. We can't do anything in civil defense unless we get warning time. Now that detection system will be made up of picket ships at sea carrying radar equipment land installations, radar and other listening devices, and airplanes flying in the skies. And I noticed a, a story in the papers just recently uh, about uh, uh, one of the first flights of uh, one of those airplanes out on the Pacific coast. And uh, that detection system will have to extend all the way from Hawaii up over the north lands of Alaska and Canada to Iceland and Greenland and down to the Azores. And if we're ever stupid enough to let the communists get into the south of us, as they tried at one time last summer, you remember, then we'll have to have the same thing to the south. Now, um, those uh, systems must be in depth. And uh, then we'll get this warning time. And our uh, plans at the present time are to request the American cities to evacuate their populations, get the people out, because if these hydrogen or atomic weapons are dropped on these great cities, uh, there's just no hope for life on the part of the people who remain in them. Well. Mr. Peterson, as I understand it, this detection system that you describe is part of the military establishment rather than yours. What exactly is your liaison with the military, and what will they do, and what will you do? Uh, well, now, the military in the United States uh, is, is an arm of the President of the United States. The Secretary of Defense, uh, Mr. Wilson, is a lieutenant of the President of the United States for defense purposes. I'm a lieutenant of the President of the United States for civil defense purposes or passive defense purposes. We're in, a, we're in exactly the same status I, uh, with respect to the place where we report. 
Uh, obviously, the military uh, organization of the Department of Defense is a much larger, a much better established, and a much more expensive operation than the one that I had. I'm not trying to make any invidious comparisons here in the responsibilities of the, of the two jobs. But uh, uh, that, I, th I believe that answers your question. Mr. Peterson, have you ever given any thought to the command decision which would call for the evacuation of cities now? Would you wait for a declaration of war or for the dropping of no, a bomb? No, you can't wait for a declaration of war in this modern age. Uh, if these Russian bombers uh, intrude uh, into the uh, territory of, of uh, the United States and Canada, uh, the minute that uh, our uh, American Air Force finds them in the air and starts shooting, uh, World War Number 3 has started. Well, do you mean, in other words, that we cannot let an unidentified aircraft appear near our cities? We cannot. We cannot, uh, we cannot permit an unidentified aircraft to come in anywhere at all into the North American hemisphere. Uh, because one airplane carrying one bomb in the future will be able to carry more explosive force in terms of TNT than all of the airplanes that bombed England in the whole last war. Or if you want to put it the other way around, all of the airplanes that bombed Germany in the last war. Well, Mr. Peterson, when you speak of evacuation, what about this, uh, this fallout we heard so much of it uh, in the Pacific? Aren't people likely to be hurt if they're evacuated by the by the radioactive cloud coming down 80 miles away? Well, uh, you have three effects, primary effects, when you explode an atomic or hydrogen weapon. You have the blast effect, and that a blast effect, depending upon the size of the weapon, will create total destruction for an area, of a radius of a certain number of miles. Then you have a fire effect. Now then, the first job is to get people out of the area where they're going to be killed, certainly by blast or by fire. Now, when you have get them out of, the, out of that area, you face the third effect, and that's the radioactivity, uh, radiological effect. Now, we have known all the time about radioactivity. There's nothing new about this. And uh, the thing that has made it more difficult in uh, recent uh, months is the fact that uh, it's quite likely now that uh, these tremendously large weapons will be detonated into the ground or near the ground close enough to the ground so they will cause to rise into the air tremendous quantities of dirt and debris of various sorts. You will recall that in Operation Ivy, the picture show, a picture of Operation Ivy, which showed the detonation of the first thermonuclear device in history at Enoetok in November 1952, that it blew a hole in the island there 175 feet deep and big enough to hold 14 Pentagon buildings. Now, that's a whale of a big hole. Now, if you blow a hole like that, that stuff goes up into the air. Now, where does it go in the air? It goes 40, 50, 60,000 feet into the air. Now, what goes up has to come down. And so, uh, uh, we've, we've been familiar with this I process for a long time. Problem is. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. It's very kind of you to come up and tell us about that. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Griffin Bancroft. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Val Peterson, Administrator of Federal Civil Defense. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. And be with us every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday at this same time for the program of the Longines Chronoscope.